The Tom Woods Show, episode 849. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody, don't let yourself get kicked around in a debate. I've got a secret weapon for you, libertyclassroom.com, where you can learn real history, real economics from people like me and other folks I trust in courses you can listen to anywhere. It is the best deal in the history of the world, and because you're a listener of the show, I'll give you the secret, which is the secret coupon page, libertyclassroom.com slash coupons. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. We're talking today about the AP history exam, and in particular, the guidelines that teachers of AP history classes have been given about the curriculum. And this is tricky because you realize if you're going to have an exam that's given to the whole country, then there's got to be some kind of national curriculum behind it. Or how are you going to make sure everybody's prepared properly for the exam? So there's a lot of stuff tied up into this whole AP history exam thing. And by the way, I never took the AP history exam myself. I took chemistry and calculus, but I never took the AP history exam. I didn't care about history. I had no interest in history whatsoever in high school. They had made darn sure it was the most boring topic imaginable, so I I avoided it like the plague. So who knows how I came to become a historian. It certainly wasn't from inspiration in high school, that's for darn sure. Well, my guests today have recently delivered a paper at the American Historical Association on this very issue, on the evolving guidelines for AP history people and what these guidelines say about American history. And are the guidelines horrible? Are they acceptable? Are they getting better or worse? That's what we're going to talk about today with Deidre and Brad Berzer, husband and wife team. Deidre is a lecturer in history at Hillsdale College where Brad is a professor. Uh, Brad's the author of several books, including Russell Kirk, American Conservative, which was very successful and very uh, well-received critically, and I'm glad to talk to them. Welcome, Deidre and Brad. Hey, Tom. Thank you. I'm virtually certain you are the first married couple I have featured as guests on the show. Gotta be. That's great. And, And our anniversary was two days ago of our engagement, so this is perfect. Oh, that is tremendous. All right, great. Well... That's what the show's here for, for touching moments like this. <laughs> and it's Valentine's Day, so that's so nice. <laughs> I, that's right. We are we're actually recording this on Valentine's Day. You're darn right. And I still don't don't feel all that great, and yet here I am just trudging along, carrying on like an idiot. You know, every every listener of the show saying, Look, you idiot, you could get in bed. No one's gonna care. But here I am. It's like there's glue on the seat. I just can't. Can't get up. That's All okay. right. We're, we're not going to make any Valentine jokes about getting in bed, so <laughs> I think we better leave that one, Tom. Yeah, let's just get going. Let's get chatting about this. <laughs> My wife is turning very red at the moment, just for your <laughs> audience. You know. the, the two of you wrote this paper that's in front of me. Is it published anywhere that people would be able to read it? No, we, we thought about submitting it to a couple of different places, and it, it still needs a little bit of work. We wrote it out. Uh, Deidre did the I, – I wrote the first draft, and then Deidre really – honed it a lot. And there's still some things in it. It was clearly written for presentation, not for publication. But we are hoping to do something with it because we think that there's some we think it's a good discussion, not just our side of it, but we think the discussion overall is really important. And we'd like to see it distributed a bit more. So we're really grateful you're doing this, Tom. Well, let's talk about this. This paper then was presented actually at the AHA, the American Historical Association? Yeah, Correct. this January. That's right. Yeah, just a, a month and a half ago. All right. So I will ask uh, later how that went. Right now, let's get into the su- the substance here because <laughs> I I don't think th- I think the last time have I ever been at an AHA meeting? I'm not even sure. I've been at the OAH, right? With with all the commies, but I don't think I've <laughs> no, been at the. You don't go that often either. We haven't been since it's been 1999 almost, when we were on the job market, right? Oh, that's right. Yeah, and you you yeah. took my job at Hillsdale. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I blame Deidre, Tom. No, but it's honestly, really everybody, awful. that actually did have, we Brad and I interviewed for the same job at the uh, Organization <laughs> of American Historians meeting. But anyway, everything turned out great for us both, Brad. We couldn't have better lives, That's right? right? Yeah. Okay. And here we are, fantastic friends, so it's all good in the end. That's right. All right, we probably should get down to brass tacks here about what's going on. You're talking here about the college board and, and AP exams and preparing for these exams and 
a lot of teachers have been complaining that they're being expected to gallop through American history at a ridiculous pace in order to cover everything that's expected of them. So there's there's that. This is not just a matter of, well, there's a desire to have uh, ideologically tainted material in the curriculum, but that's not altogether absent here either. What are the problems that were or still are being complained about with regard to the teaching of history at the secondary level here? There seems to be so many things going on with both sides of this issue. So I think it might help a little bit to know where we're coming from. So at the AHA, there was a panel that came out of a protest at Jefferson County Schools in Colorado over the rewriting of this framework. And so there was a 2006 framework that you're referring to where the teachers were galloping through gallons of facts to try to get their students ready to take the AP exam. And so the college board decided to revise it and they rolled out some revisions. They tested them ahead of time, but 2014 was the big date of the revisions. And those were the ones that caught the attention of a lot of conservatives. And um, what happened in Jefferson County, Colorado was the school board just became completely unhinged over the, the framework. And so the AHA decided to have a panel about this because it was being held in Denver. They wanted some local things. And Patty Limerick, who is a dear friend of mine and Brad's and likes to create what she calls excellent plans for us, decided that we should be the conservative voice of this panel and that we should actually look at these curriculum frameworks and figure out if any of the criticisms were, I don't know, right, I guess, or correct. Tom, do you know do you know Patty Limerick or her work? I don't. Should I? Yeah, she um she's fascinating. I mean, she's an amazing person, but she was Yale trained PhD and came out of that whole movement in the early eighties called the New Western History, where they were trying to they were trying to reverse the kind of Turner story, and it was pretty left in, in its origins. And Patty Patty was very much a new leftist. Uh, I'm not sure she would put herself there now. Though she did a lot of really, and she still does a lot of great work, but if she is a leftist, she's the most open-minded one we've ever met. She's just, uh, she's a delightful person and just brilliant. And I think she doesn't really have patience for any ideology left or right, which makes her wonderful. But that, that was part. So we have a long time friendship with her, but then we got to work with her when we were in Colorado a few years ago and got to meet her again and kind of re, re, reignite our friendship. So she, she's a great person. She'd be great for you to have on. Uh, she, I can't, nobody knows property issues, especially with water rights and other things better than Patty does. Uh, she'd be an amazing guest for you. All right. Well, th- that's good to know. She runs the Center for the American West at the University of Colorado. And what they have done is tried to take a neutral stance on every issue. And it's created a lot more enemies than she thought she would ever have. And trying to take a neutral stance on things like fracking just doesn't go well in a place like Colorado. We're either one way or the other when it comes to fracking. So So, anyway, that's where all of this came from. And so um, the 2014 revisions try to be more general in a sense. And they took a lot of the weight off of details, historical details, and put more on like educational standards, I'll call them, big concepts like doing comparative analysis and what yeah. else, demographics and things like this. So things that students should be the able to do. points of historical thinking. Right. And so when they came to periodization, there was nothing about the American Revolution. There was nothing about the Constitution and the founders uh, what they said about World War II was really only about concentration camps for Japanese Americans, American and there was nothing right. about the Nazis, and there was nothing about why the soldiers were fighting from the Allied perspective, and nothing about success of the war. <laughs> and, yeah. um, so there was a lot of criticism that was rightly placed, and the College Board did, to be fair to them, rewrite the revisions. And they came out with something, I think, that was much, much better in 2015. And that's what they have now. So they listened to all of the critics and fixed things. Yeah, that, that's surprising to me. Isn't that surprising to you? Doesn't it seem like we always lose these battles? <laughs> so now it's actually more into a, a middle space. 
than it was. And of course, some of the uh, the left wing people are upset that they went too far in the other direction. Um, but I think the problem is that we kept coming back to is to how do you quantify a humanistic endeavor like history? And so we're, we're making these students learn things in a way that makes history completely a social science. And so it takes out all the things that attract those of us who are historians to actually studying history. Right. So, Tom, we got we got interested in this for a lot of reasons, partly because we were asked to do it. But it also this whole controversy happened to hit when I was at Colorado for that year. So we had a lot of people calling and emailing. And of course, they wanted a, a non leftist viewpoint on these things. And as you know, Tom, and of course, you and Gutsman have written such great stuff on this and being politically incorrect and so forth. But you know, it's amazing how much we found, at least Deidre and I did, that though the complaints of those people on the conservative and libertarian side were valid, a lot of it was just language differences. So uh, you, you have this whole conversation that's been going on in the history profession since the 60s using a certain kind of jingoism and language. And these people, like someone who's our age, Tom, who's got kids in, in school, they don't know that language and they hear this stuff. And not only are they distrustful of academia, but they feel they've been left out of the conversation. And, and of course they have. But that was, we found that a lot of times the anger had to do more with misunderstanding than it did with actual ideas, though the ideas were there too. I'm reading in your paper repeated acknowledgement that by 2014 and 15, things had gotten much better and that uh, you had a document that more people could agree with and certainly that you felt more comfortable with. Yet there's something something difficult about the whole project because if you're preparing for a nationwide exam, I mean, I, I can understand why people would say I'm not in favor of a national curriculum. But if you're preparing students for a nationwide exam that will be exactly the same in Peoria – as it is in New York City, yep. then implicitly you have a national curriculum, right. at, at least for the AP students. And I, it seems like it's hard to, to do that without imposing something on the teachers, possibly against their will. Yeah, we, we were really fascinated, Tom, that all of this began with the formation of the College Board in 1900. And it's just the ultimate progressive. It's not quite public. It's not quite private. You've got this revolving door of people who either work for the college board as a company, and they essentially have I mean, this nationwide curriculum. They don't have a monopoly, but they're pretty darn close to having it. Yeah, they determine so much. And the revolving door between those people who are on the college board or going into government and the Department of Education and then going back to the college board, it's really, it's just, it's the epitome of progressivism. And Deidre and I both thought as we were writing this paper what struck us is that both sides, the people who had called themselves conservatives, as well as those who called themselves the left or progressives, they're telling the same story from different viewpoints. It really is either the, the nation triumphant, if you're on the right, or it's the nation repentant, if you're on the left. And they're both just kind of crazy forms of progressive nationalism, in, in our view. And that's so... You know, we're not living in a, in a fairyland. We realize these these standards are going to be there, but we did try and look at them, not just the standards as they are, but the very roots of them. And I think Deidre and I, and maybe Tom, you're coming from a slightly different perspective, especially given your economics background. But yeah, Deidre and I are just so rooted in the humanities, and we don't really like <laughs> we don't really like history as social science. Um, it just doesn't it doesn't mesh. I think if we're telling a real story about human beings. There's just too much in the social sciences that diminishes their free will. And that I we saw that, at least as we were looking, whether it was the kind of good version of the A push or the bad version, they both still really negate a lot and promote a kind of nationalist agenda. A push is AP US history. <laughs> right. And there are over five hundred thousand high school seniors, juniors and seniors a year taking this exam. So it really does matter. And we're thinking this is the cream of the crop. These kids who are taking the AP US history courses. So the version of history that they learn matters very much for our civic engagement. And of course, because they learn it in high school and then they, if they get these credits, they don't have to take it in college. 
So it's a weird, there's some weird incentive structures here too. You would think high school teachers and college teachers would not want to diminish history majors, but there is a, an effect of this because they can take it for credit, then this is the only history they ever get. And it's not good history at all. And it is interesting what you say about the two possibilities that we're given, that you've either got, as you say, you've either got some kind of, well, two different kinds of progressive nationalism, but that's the way, that's the lens you use to look at U.S. history. And it, it also means that for the left, they come to think that anybody who's not on the left is just somebody who thinks U.S. history should simply be rah, 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 the government can do no wrong. That's right. But, but what kind of an alternative is that? That's no, you know, that's nothing. That's that's embarrassing, too. I would be embarrassed if they thought that's what I was demanding. Right. Yes, exactly. Right. And I think part of the confusion on the part of the left and the college board from hearing all of the criticisms of their revisions is that this is the language and the story that's been taught for the last 30 years. And so they didn't think there would be anybody who could possibly disagree with it because this is what has been going on for several generations in the halls of academia. So right, right. They course, don't even... this is the story, right? There aren't other stories. This is it. And the way some of the media presented it was also as it, it's this Manichaean struggle. And it really, you know, again, it's more, they have more in common with each other, I think, than they have differences. But there is that frustration on the part of the average intelligent citizen who just thinks, you know, what is all this crud and why did we get bypassed here? And I think their anger, it's the same kind of anger that brought Donald Trump into power. You know, it's they, they just, they can't necessarily articulate it, not because they're not smart. It's just because they don't have the professional lingo that historians do, but there's no doubt they are angry. And uh, they're very angry. And there is a kind of uh, the right right now, as, as you well know, Tom, has a very strong populist streak to it. And that anger is manifesting itself in very strange ways. There's a third group here, too, and that's the teachers and what they do in their classrooms. And um, the teachers who were on the panel with us were extremely angry because they felt like both sides were not thinking about the teachers in any sort of positive way <laughs> it's sort of They're this assumption ciphers. yeah that the teachers were puppets for whatever yeah. side um had the loudest voices and as anyone who's been in a classroom knows I mean, that's just <laughs> not how it works right <laughs> and so um one teacher in particular who was on on the panel and came from jefferson county and invited news crews and um the school board and everyone else to come into her classroom and watch what she was doing no one ever took her up on it but they were all outside <laughs> filming all the time. And so she tried to turn all of this into um, a teaching moment for her students. But um, she's pretty neat. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> sure. Just the place that these AP exams play. I mean, it's a very delicate balance. And we're parents of a senior in high school. Okay. He signed up for two AP exams, not the U.S. history one. <laughs> but but um, the Oklahoma state legislature tried to to say, we're not going to do AP at all. And there was a huge outcry from parents because this has the potential of saving lots and lots of tuition dollars for the families, right. right? It's $93 for the exam. And you could get up to six credits. Is that right? It just depends on the school, right? Right. Different colleges treat them. I mean, $93 for six credits is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. So the economics of the situation <laughs> bears, bears fruit. But then there's the idea of, you know, are they really getting what they would get from a first year U.S. history survey? from the high school class, well, maybe, and maybe they're getting better because they're in a group of 25 <laughs> kids rather than 300. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of trade-offs. Definitely. Have either of you taught at a, well, I know Brad that you were at uh, Colorado for that year. Have you taught at any institution other than Hillsdale? University of Texas at San Antonio. We both taught there. Okay. Yeah. We were there for one year, Tom, okay. right at the beginning of our careers. Any obvious difference between how you felt you needed to teach history at those places? You know, we, I think Deep and I were both pretty, for better or worse, we were pretty bullheaded about not allowing ourselves, even then in the early, well, mid to late 90s, not allowing ourselves to be taken in by the left. And we just kind of tried to get our own path going even then. Um, 
And amazingly, we didn't get crushed. <laughs> I look back now, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm surprised we got away with so much. And, and Tom, that's when, you know, you and I have talked about this before. That's when I was reading your stuff in Latin mass. And, you know, I just, I was, Deidre and I were just determined we were going to do our own thing. And of course, we didn't have a lot of, you know, <laughs> we didn't have a big family and a lot of expenses. So we were in a, a bit of a different situation where if it didn't work, we could go on and be fine uh, economically. But I don't think, you know, I think there were certain expectations when we were at UTSA to teach a certain way, but we ended up kind of doing what we wanted and we really enjoyed it and it ended up working well. But that's also when the Hillsdale position opened and we wanted to be around, we wanted to be at a liberal arts school that was private, you know, rather than a public school, even though we had a great experience at that public school overall. So you would say that in summary, what we've had happen is that this framework, these guidelines that inform AP U.S. history teachers as they're preparing people for this important exam have gotten somewhat better. There's been clarification on uh, on some things. There's been less uh, uh, less obvious ideological commitment to a particular position. Like, for instance, I read early on the the view of the United States as, as an oppressor nation and the founding fathers were terrible and all that. And, and there's a, a little bit less of that. So should somebody walk away from this episode saying, well, there were problems in some guidelines that were given to AP American history teachers, but now they've basically been solved. So good. Well, it's definitely, I'll go to Bob Higgs. Uh, mm -hmm. It's definitely the ratchet effect. So yes, it's better than it was. It's still also worse than it. So it's immediately better but over the long term, it's still worse. And I think as long as you know, Deidre and I kind of playfully put in, you know, reference to Pink Floyd and another brick in the wall, I, I just think it's very, very, from a Hayekian standpoint, it's just very difficult to be able to teach reality in just these boxes. So it's a problem of progressivism, really, and of the professionalization of history that has been slower than in most other academic professions and branches, but it's still there. So, no, I wouldn't walk away, Tom, thinking things are good. I would say that in a relative sense, they're better. But I honestly, I think that as libertarians and conservatives, we need to be questioning the very basis of standardization rather than the actual standards. We allow ourselves too easily to get caught up in, oh, is the founding father, is George Washington be treating, is he being treated fairly or not? I think it's a much more important question, at least from our standpoint, that we ask, you know, why are we telling Professor or, or Mr. whatever in Peoria to be teaching this in the same way that someone from uh, Brazosport, Texas is teaching it? I mean, I think that we've really... We, we should not, whether it's in college level or the high school level, turn teachers or professors into ciphers. They have to be independent beings as well. And not that we shouldn't hold them up to standards in terms of excellence, but I think it's, it's terribly wrong that we're moving towards this professionalization and progressive version of uh, this monopoly that we're essentially allowing the college board a private quasi-public company that sometimes is going for major profit and sometimes rests on its nonprofit status, we're essentially turning it into the board of education for the entire country. And I, I just think that's terribly, terribly dangerous. Even if they were teaching great stuff in the long run, that's just too much power when we're talking about future generations here to have that concentrated. Uh, so I, I really think we need to be looking uh, those of us who are not on the left and not progressives, I think we very, very desperately need to be challenging the very essence of standardization as it's being used right now by anybody. But let me play devil's advocate. Wouldn't somebody on the progressive left say, yes, it's true there's a danger that there can be an ideological bias imposed on the teaching of history. But on the other hand, it does seem obvious that it would be beneficial to have some kind of standardization, some kind of regularization to make sure that some kid in a hick town isn't given some terrible, ridiculous education. Right. And I think that's what they would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. And um, it, it's, a, it's a viable argument. I think the, the response to that and one of the things that we found, at least, and we're still exploring this too, Tom, so I don't want to present you – know, Deidre is much better on the specifics than I am, I think. But – so we don't want to present ourselves as the experts by any means. This was something we got asked to do, and we were very glad and learned a lot uh, by going into it, and we were honored to be a part of it. But 
we also it was interesting to see the left's reaction in that you know they were pretty surprised that we even cared about the liberal arts they were pretty surprised that <laughs> we cared about individuality i mean they in their minds they are so locked into a rigorous national program of conformity that they can't really see beyond that and that that's what i think is very telling that we have to challenge not not that there shouldn't be some standards but those standards can be done competitively as well, not just by this quasi-public, quasi-private thing that exists with these rotating people. There have to be better models for this. And you know, all of this comes at the time that we're really losing the great books and the, the great tradition of the West around 1900. But the choice shouldn't have to be, I think, between a kind of Teddy Roosevelt nationalism or Woodrow Wilson nationalism. And that's essentially where we're at right now. It, it would be nice to have some other options as well. And finally, let me ask, how was this received when you delivered this paper? Deidre will have to answer that one. <laughs> Brad was stuck in a snowbank. It, it's a funny, <laughs> Tom, I was twice, I, I went off a mountain road and I was totally fine, but my car got stuck on the way to this thing and Deidre had flown in separately. So I was stuck in the Rocky Mountains. Oh, no, I, did, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll let her. <laughs> um, I think it, it actually went over pretty well because – I tried to be praising and gracious of the college board where, where it was merited. And um, what most of the responders picked up on was this juxtaposition of what is humane and what isn't. And all of them wanted to say that was the direction they would want to be going in. You know, of course we want to be liberal arts oriented and focus on history as a humanity, but in all practicality, how do you do that? And they don't want to throw out the AP um, organization and the whole system. So their response is more one of, okay, is there any way to make this process more humane? And Brad's arguing, or just was, that no, you can't. Right? You can't well, take standardization and look at history in humane terms. So what we did, Tom, and this won't surprise you at all, but just immediately, as soon as we were asked to do this and we said yes, we did two things. Number one, we looked at the history of the college board, the group behind all of this, and we were fascinated by, yeah, again, all the linkages and how utterly progressive it was. And then the second thing we did is we went back and looked at the arguments being given by Albert J. Nock. Paul Elmer Moore and Irving Babbitt against the professionalization of history and of academia overall. So that was really, that was, we were coming from that perspective, kind of the old libertarian humanist perspective versus progressivism, but also trying to really look at the institutional foundations of the college board. Yeah, I didn't know anything about the college board. And then when you said it was founded in 1900, with this desire to professionalize and standardize, I thought, ah, oh, progressive. Yeah, I, know. I see it. I see the fingerprints all over it. Well, is is there anything given that your paper's not available? What can, is there anything people can read a book or an article about anything having to do with history standardization or anything like this? Tom, I'm still, you know, I'm so glad for the Mises organization because uh, you know, the, I think one of the best things we can still read is Albert J. Knox's book on education in the United States. Yeah, that is a, a brilliant book. And talk about you know, just a great libertarian anarchist look at the classics. Uh, and of course, anything by, by Paul Omer Moore or Irving Babbitt, uh, Deidre's got a few in particular, more modern sources. Um, Bill McClay has a great piece called History, American Democracy, and the AP Test Controversy that was in Hillsdale College's um, Speech Digest called Imprimus in July 2015, and that's available on the Hillsdale College website. It's a really great piece. Yeah, but of modern stuff, Tom, that's pretty much it. You know, there were some things during the controversy at NRO, at National Review, mm -hmm. and some things at Breitbart, but, uh, you know, they were, they were good, but I think they were still really... The controversy was still just too too heated on both sides. Uh, Deidre and I also, I don't know if you had a chance to look through the whole paper, Tom, but we ended with what I think is one of Russell Kirk's greatest books, and certainly back when he was far more libertarian than he became later, his book on academic freedom, uh, which uh, Pierre Goodrich of Liberty Fund actually 
funded much of that book back in the early 1950s and distributed it to every college president in the U.S. I don't think it had much of an effect, unfortunately, but it is a really great book. Wow. Okay. I knew that book existed and I had somehow totally forgot about it. And obviously you are the biographer of Russell Kirk. So, well, I have that on, I have that on PDF that I would be happy to share with you privately. So, and anyone who's interested, I'm happy to share that privately. Any of your listeners. Yes, yeah, wow. it's out of print. Oh, it, it really I is. To, okay. Yeah. I don't want to step on Annette Kirk's toes, but I think she'd be fine with us distributing it privately. Huh. Okay. Well, we'll just leave it there and see what inquiries we get. But it's a beautiful little passage at the end of your paper, indeed. Isn't that great? Oh, when Kirk was on fire, he was on fire. <laughs> that's that's tremendous. Well, uh, first of all, congratulations, by the way, on winning that uh, book prize. Tell me again the name of the prize. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, that was through, yeah, the Pellucci through ISI. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, – that was that was really meaningful. So thank you. And you gave the acceptance speech, and it was on C-SPAN, and it was just glorious and beautiful. Yeah, so, well, thanks, Tom. Yeah, I think there's a lot of Tom Woods spirit ho- hovering over that. So I even thanked you in it. Oh, that's very – in fact, yeah, I remember you told me that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, thanked you on national TV. That was fun. And I actually – I honest to goodness, that was the same weekend – that Mises was having an event in Boston. Yeah, I remember. Because I was actually considering uh, sneaking up there and surprising you. Oh, are you serious? Yeah, that was I couldn't. A blast. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate the time that both of you spent here. I'm glad you did what you did. And uh, let's just go on being the, the people you can't categorize. It's fun being those people. Amen. <laughs> Thank you both. Thanks so much, Tom. All right, that's going to do it for us for today. Let me tell you what I've got coming up for you. Tomorrow, Sheriff Mack, Sheriff Richard Mack comes back to the show, which is always interesting. And then Friday, Kevin Gutzman is going to join us to talk about his brand new book, published with St. Martin's, Thomas Jefferson Revolutionary. Great stuff for this week. So if you are enjoying the show, consider becoming part of the elite as a supporting listener at supportinglisteners.com, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.